welcome to episode three of Practically Intelligent. I'm Akshay, and I'm a VC out of Seattle. And I am Sanan Ozdemir, an AI entrepreneur based in San Francisco. Awesome. And uh, today's an awesome episode. Uh, we're first going to dig into a uh, really uh, hot space in AI. Uh, vector databases and embeddings cover the concepts uh, and underlying uh, the, those startups. And then we're going to have a special guest on, uh, Leo Dirac, who was uh, the first member of AWS's uh, deep learning team uh, and now the founder of an exciting uh, computer vision startup. But um, maybe Very to exciting. just kick off, maybe just to kick off news and notes, um, we are seeing an incredible amount of venture activity and intention in the vector database and semantic search space. <laughs> Uh, almost. I'm glad. Uh, Finally. Yeah. It's. <laughs> yeah. So that, uh, so that it's kind of crazy. Someone was telling me, uh, you know, they did their thesis on this particular area and their PhD was in the basement of their academic building. No one besides their panel showed up. And now they just like will post, a, you know, a random archive paper on something they did four years ago to Twitter. Yeah. And it'll get like. 10,000 views. So it must be an interesting time that, uh, you know, every NLP researcher is a celebrity. Uh, it, so. it is. And I'll, I'll tell you like a quick anecdote. So I, my background is in theoretical math and I got my master's in it. Um, and one of the funny enough, one of the kind of like anecdotes I always tell people, like, why did you leave, you know, your master's PhD track to go do entrepreneurship? Uh, and I go, one of the main reasons was my, uh, you know, someone I looked up to very much in the, in the math department at Johns Hopkins he, he and I were just talking one day just in front of a chalkboard and he kind of, he kind of looked at me and he, he, he more or less some, something along the lines of, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to know that any research you put out, no one will really care about for at least a decade. And I kind of sat there and I was like, oh man, like, like that hit a little too hard. Um, but now it's, it's interesting because even what you just said four or five years ago, that gap between what people are putting out and, and what people are consuming and really investing in is really shrinking, which is great um, for people like me who, you know, put sometimes uh, uh, would like to put out research or consume it. It's awesome. But yeah, and embeddings and, and semantic search and vector databases, all this stuff is for me, not new. And for everyone else, it's like, oh, this, this is like the new, new big thing, which is really cool. <laughs> for sure. And so, uh, you know, maybe helping people understand uh, that research and, and how to put that into production is exactly why we're here. So Pinecone is an AI, uh, you know, company does uh, is a vector database company raising at a $700 million valuation um, revenue uh, growing rapidly still in the single digits. You also have uh, Chroma raising an $18 million series a, uh, Qdrin, which is kind of the first open source competitor of raising, I think, a uh, large round as well that uh, probably TBD will be announced. And then um, Wevite uh, and Milvis, other companies as well that are also probably uh, seeing kind of funding soon. So super attractive space. But essentially, this is all these are databases that store embeddings. And on. so talk to us mm -hmm. a little bit about what are embeddings and why are vector databases so popular all of a sudden? Sure. Wow. What are embeddings? Embeddings are, to put it, that, 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 to start off, embeddings are really just a machine readable numerical representation of something, right? Now, in the case of NLP, that something is text. Now, it could be a word, could be a phrase, could be an entire knowledge base or documentation uh, explaining something. You know, however big the the input is, the output is always this fixed length vector. So, I could t I could type in a single word, or I could type in an essay, and the output from it, an embedder, something that embeds, something that creates embeddings, the output will be the same length vector. So, five hundred and twelve numbers for each one of them that is supposed to represent some meaning of that piece of text. Now, I'm being very vague for a reason, because meaning it has different meanings depending on what industry you're in, right? Mostly people will take that to mean semantic meaning, which, which translates to, are these two things about the same thing? Are they trying to convey a similar message as each other? If they do, the resulting embeddings, those those vectors, will should be 
close to each other, like quantifiably close to each other using some metric like cosine or whatever. And then you would use that similarity distance to say, okay, if these two embeddings are close to each other, then these two pieces of text must be close together. I must need that piece of text for my task. So that can range from I'm typing in a query, hey, how do I reset my password? And perhaps the embedding of the password reset documentation is really close to my query of how do I reset my password? Awesome, let me serve that up to the user or use it in context with GPT-4 to answer the question. But on the other side, you have companies like eBay who spent money and time putting out research uh, to create their own embeddings system to say, well, we don't really care about semantic meaning, but if these two embeddings are close to each other, then you probably want to look at them in a single search history uh, session. So depending on how you define close to each other is up to the industry. And then whichever embedder they choose to use follows from there. And then the task will hopefully be completed. That's my, this concludes my 101 TED Talk on embeddings. <laughs> Super helpful. And and some of the folks listening probably were already aware of that. But one thing I think that's interesting is at some level, these are databases. So you'll mm -hmm. see kind of how they scale, how they perform on, you know, in memory, you'll see whether that built an authentication variety of sort of different things. But how do you even choose which vector database to work with in this landscape? Starting yeah. with point one, you, you have a specific use case. So Sanan, can you walk us through maybe some considerations and maybe a, you know, a sample user journey that someone might have and what, um, what maybe uh, things should be on their mind when considering a vector database uh, starting out? Yeah, it's, it's relatively fresh on my mind because I, I just finished writing the chapter in my new book on embeddings and vector databases. Um, but really, it's not, it's not so out of touch with how people are, are already thinking. To your point, it's just a database. At the end of the day, you are talking about a database. So when you talk about a database, you have to talk about well, what is your uptime? What is the efficiency in storing and retrieval? Uh, and, and obviously that's going to be your, your kind of biggest logistical factor is how quickly can I store things and how quickly can I retrieve things? Because for companies, again, like eBay, who are storing tens of millions of, of, of vectors, whether they're items or descriptions or users, whatever that might be, they really have to think about, well, how quickly can I retrieve item recommendations to serve up to the user? Because that has to flow through our entire pipeline. So if that takes two seconds, you know, <laughs> we're, we're really lagging behind on how quickly we can show item recommendations. So a, a lot of what people think about, you know, after cost, obviously, cost is always going to be the, at the end of the day, something you think about. But per cost unit, how many vectors can I store? How quickly can I store them? And how quickly am I going to be able to retrieve them? Those are the baseline considerations. If you kind of graduate from there, you're also talking about more logical separations, right? Like namespaces. So Pinecone offers the ability to separate your databases into kind of logical differentiations called namespaces where you could have, okay, my my maybe my European users are in this namespace and my American users are in this namespace because our data science team has found that they're different enough that they require different kinds of embedding. So to make things easier on our end, we've just logically separated them out. I've made that example up, but that kind of ease of use is going to also be a relatively minor, but still a factor of consideration. So you got price, you got literally just latency, throughput, speed of the system. You've got kind of ease of use, logical separations, um, you know, access controls, permission structures, again, something you are already thinking about if you were a DevOps manager, a database manager, so nothing new there. So those are kind of the three baseline considerations you want to consider. Now, each of those obviously can get a little bit more complicated, but price, speed, and ease of use are, are going to be your, your, your top three. Totally. And I think in generally from the old database world, the, the two ways you can differentiate a product broadly are performance and developer experience, right? And so mm -hmm. a bunch of what you talked about fall in that category. One thing I'm curious about is, uh, and I've seen maybe a few blog posts come out this past week on this, is that latter part is there's a rush of new developers uh, coming and using this technology. And I actually don't know, Sanan, but what is a great developer experience for a vector database? look like and what should developers and pms be looking for 
outside mm-hmm. of, you know, doing the performance. Because I actually do think currently, you know, especially with a lot of self-hosting and a lot of times people are just looking to get started and they're not doing kind of some, you know, comparison and proper testing. They might just use Pinecone because they know it relatively performs well. What is a great developer experience look like when getting started with a vector database and what should people be considering on that angle? Yeah. I mean, there's actually been a outside of vector databases in the last year, a couple of years, there's been an, an interesting rush in kind of abstracting away database technology. I feel like database technologies have always been this specter looming over developers. He was like, I mean, of course we need a database, but like, whatever, it's Postgres and AWS, it's DigitalOcean, it's whatever, who cares? But then companies come up like Superbase or um, I believe PlanetScale, who are offering these um, easy, accessible databases through an API, through a Python wrapper. And they're like, don't worry about the database. Hey, just sign up with us and we'll scale when you need us to scale. You just put down a card and, and you know, for better or for worse, we'll charge you when things get too hairy. Um, in a similar way, I think Pinecone and other companies are following suit, right? I use Pinecone personally. Uh, I've never paid them for what it's worth because I've always stayed under their their free limit. But they're really easy to set up. Like the second I decide I need a vector database, whether it's a prototype or a hobby project or um, even at production, I know it's as easy as, great, import Python wrapper, insert API key, dot create database, dot create namespace, dot use namespace. That ease of use as a developer for me is, is really crucial because especially if I were someone who didn't quite know all the underpinnings of a vector database, I can at least now set something up to test it, to see how fast is this thing actually? Let me actually use it to see how fast it is and how it feels to use it. But if you have to set up, you know, for days, talk to an enterprise salesperson and, and go through all the contracts before we even get a chance to try the product, you know, you're, you're kind of out of luck there. So I think in a lot of ways, again, what's old is new. The, the idea of being developer first, very of the Twilio mindset, right? When Twilio, you know, their, their, their first big marketing push was ask your developer. And I love that campaign because they, they were so confident to send a text message. All you got to do is import Python package. Python.send SMS, you're good. That's it. You've done the thing. That was so exciting. And I think Pinecow and other companies are, are, are super base and planet scale. They're, they're rushing to kind of meet that standard of, Hey, your developer is going to love this so much. You're going to, you're, you as the engineering manager are going to have to put your card down because they're not going to want to leave. There's a stickiness at the end of the day. Definitely. And I don't think it just, you know, stops with the database, right? I think there, this is maybe one of the most exciting areas of infrastructure over the next two uh, to three years is as we talk to folks that, you know, are working within OpenAI, DeepMind and working on large scale AI deployments, there's not actually that many of them. They are actually figuring out from this OpenAI, OpenAI released this cookbook and they said search might be better than fine tuning. And if you extrapolate search trends, people are, are, yes, people are going to load more and more data into these databases. And that search element of similarity search of finding what data is relevant for my task is become going to become crucial. And I think that um, there's a bunch of different considerations that actually are going to completely rewrite how developers work with um, AI and AI on their data, because there's questions of security that aren't solved. How do you shard mm-hmm. the database efficiently? How do you, when you're working with large scale, multiple models, um, you orchestrate similarity search. There's a bunch of problems yeah. where you extrapolate the lines on. This becomes an incredibly rich area that um, there's a bunch of problems that are, are unsolved. Yeah, and the whole idea of ML ops, again, what's old is new, right? A vector database is effectively one component of ML ops. You have to manage your models, you're versioning your models, versioning your data, model stores, feature stores, vector databases. Some companies are already doing, Databricks already does all that for what it's worth, right? Databricks has all these components. Um, you know, you can have, uh, we've used them as a vector database before. I, I personally use them as a vector database. It's not the most efficient and effective, but it's good. It, I mean, it, it's a it's a solid product. Um, so that that kind of ecosystem is, is going to play a, a big role as well. And, and speaking of the cookbook, you know, the, the, to talk about fine tuning versus is just using it in context. Yeah, I mean, again, like I, I literally fresh on my mind. One of my case studies was in my book was using GPT four and Pinecone as a vector database to 
instantaneously give it access to some dynamically shifting knowledge base and say, well, if your knowledge base is your customer support database, your knowledge base could be Wikipedia, your knowledge could be whatever data set you choose to upload. And then GPT-4 can just retrieve them whenever it wants and use them in context, as opposed to fine tuning, which takes time, takes GPUs, takes people, takes labeling, takes all this time to do that, which frankly, could get better results. It could, and to your point, sometimes we're saying it won't even get better results, but also just takes more time. So why why go that route when you can at least try, again, with the ease of development, you can at least try the vector database, which is a lot of what my point is in, in, in a lot of my writing is you don't have to go right towards the ML engineers and, and, and all that. You can, here are some tips you can try to kind of get off the ground before you get that far. <laughs> I think this is one of the most exciting areas that's not being talked enough, right? When you talked about dynamic shifting data sets, right now we're kind of just statically prompting on what we guess might be interesting. Ideally, over time, you get a way to dynamic prompting, which is the system itself can figure out what data to retrieve. So this idea of, you know, um, you know, human guided but largely, you know, machine led information retrieval, uh, which is really nascent. I am curious, you know, something I'm thinking about is, does that lead to just, you know, a new Elastic, a new Lucene, a new big uh, search player, or can you have uh, different specialist players um, uh, for uh, different, you know, types of, of search, given there's so much, so many different modalities, so many different types yeah. of tasks you're going to be wanting to be doing. So it's interesting yeah. to think how people will do this. And on the, on the idea of dynamic prompting, literally one of the, one, again, I know I keep referencing my book. I just wrote this chapter, but the, I, I, I ran an experiment where I did a few shot prompting with a um, arithmetic data set asking GPT-4 and chat GPT to do arithmetic, which it's not amazing at all the time. Um, but it, I showed that if you do have a vector database and you are able to access formally um, solved arithmetic problems and you bring them in as a dynamic few shot problem. Like here's the, here's the arithmetic problem. Let me grab three similar arithmetic problems and show them as a few shot example. Even chat GPT, you know, the one, the, the most advanced system that OpenAI has does increase in accuracy when shown similar examples within the context. So even for the simplest of problems, quote unquote, of uh, grade school arithmetic, Pulling in dynamic examples and pulling in dynamically um, relevant content does improve the performance of these large language models, definitely compared to just static prompting. When I talk to sorry, when I talk to engineering managers that are dealing with some of these larger scale deployments, you can kind of guess at which companies uh, that might be. They uh, talk about. Uh, specifically an issue with embeddings that they're increasingly facing is, again, topic we're coming back to again, privacy and security. There is not an idea of multi-tenancy with your data once you put it into a vector database, right? So you are going to be intermingling data. It's going to be incredibly hard to distinguish different sets of customer data, what is actually powering the model, uh, what's, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, you know, uh, environment specific. And I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a bunch of uh, security companies that kind of attach to the vector database layer that provide, you know, best in class authentication along with search that um, help customers um, deal with this specific problem around customer data. Um, one, I think regulations incoming and there's going to be a new GDPR for AI and the, the punishments are going to be pretty uh, severe. And then two is just enterprise customers know now that their data is their moat. They, uh, they're smart and they're going to want to protect their data, protect their embeddings. And I think that I still see that as a key challenge. And there's relatively, I think, few companies that I've come across that are, uh, are, are tackling this, that are kind of in the zeitgeist. So that is one area, Sanan, I, I'm really excited to explore um, because if you are working with enterprise customer data, just dumping in a database and putting it, you know, just you know, throwing your model at it may not work. So this idea of, no. you know, secure sharding of taking different information retrieval, selecting the data that is appropriate to be used will become incredibly important over the next 12 to 20 more months as, as more of these startups start to sell to enterprises. Yeah. And what, what adds to that challenge is an embedding, as I mentioned, are just numbers. So when you look at a vector database, depending on how you set it up, you're usually just staring at a bunch of numbers, which is like, well, okay, which of these rows is sensitive? I don't know. 
it depends on the input text. Whatever you inputted the text, wherever that lives, which may not be in the same database, right? Like you could use Pinecone to retrieve the vector, but maybe the raw text is stored somewhere else more efficiently. Now, Pinecone does offer the ability to store raw text in the meta te in the metadata, to be fair, but it's not the most efficient way to do that, right? You, you might have a more efficient text retrieval system given the index that Pinecone serves. Okay, so now you got raw data over here, you've got embedded data over here, they talk to each other, sure, or you have some system that talks to both, I should say, but to your point, okay, well, if someone wants to remove the data in the raw database, okay, well, how does that affect the vector database? And that orchestration becomes more challenging, kind of coming back to ease of use on the developer side and using namespaces and using sharding and using all these all these techniques to make things easier, but that problem still remains, right? If, if a customer needs to delete their data or at least logically separate it, that touches a lot of systems now and you have to orchestrate all that. And if you want to learn more, you can check out Sun's book, Soon on Shelves, <laughs> at a Barnes & Noble near you. Soon on Shelves. Oh, I don't know about Barnes & Noble, but it's you can't get it on, on O'Reilly. <laughs> uh, you can get it on O'Reilly. We'll, we'll link to it. Uh, yeah, we'll link to it. Uh, or prior, prior book soon. Um, I'm excited for this next segment. We talked to Leah Dirac, uh, founder and CEO of Grimelight. Um, I, uh, we'll, we'll transition over there, but it's not, I just love this conversation because uh, a lot of people, there's this craze, but there's also this kind of craze around big data and auto ML at the start of the decade, another craze around deep learning, you know, 2013 to 2015. And I think some people can, you know, investors, developers, et cetera, will gain a lot from the first part of this conversation um, around uh, kind of a walk through history and what people, uh, so some lessons there. And then I think they'll also get a lot from how Leo is designing and thinking about his application with, around, uh, specifically around this idea of human escalation and human in the loop. Um, Sounds good. Well, let's kick it over. Uh, awesome. And we're super excited to welcome uh, Leah Drock, founder and CEO of uh, Groundlight AI, to the podcast. Uh, previously, Leah was at uh, Amazon and was a core member of uh, their early ML team that was responsible for scaling up a bunch of exciting technologies in the company, uh, most notably uh, AWS SageMaker. Uh, Leo, thanks so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Hey, it's my pleasure. It's uh, Thanks for having me. For sure. And we want to spend a bunch of time on Groundlight, uh, but you were mm -hmm. at AWS at such an interesting time, really, in the history of deep learning. And I thought we could yeah. uh, take a walk down history lane. Just paint a picture for me, what was the state of deep learning broadly uh, when you joined Amazon and uh, what did the market look like then? Absolutely. So it was, uh, this is mid 2013 when I first joined Amazon and I joined the team that internally we called EML for Elastic Machine Learning. And this was an internal machine learning tool that a bunch of Amazon teams were using for very practical things like uh, targeting, uh, targeting marketing uh, or various retail activities. And it was on a road to be released through AWS as Amazon's first machine learning service. And machine learning was still fairly obscure back then. And I joined mm -hmm. the team as the deep learner because I had discovered uh, convolutional neural nets and uh, Alex Krzyzewski's uh, dramatic victory in 2012 uh, of the ImageNet competition, where he just beat the pants off of everybody else by a wide margin. And the thing, I, like I was, I was trying to do some com computer vision stuff at the time, and the thing that really caught my eye about Krzyzewski's win wasn't the quality of the results so much, but it was the reaction from the CV community and reading how many people were saying things like, Oh, this is this is just uh, a fluke. It's um, this won't this won't hold up generally to other things. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, that I don't need to pay any attention to this. And then hearing other uh, Krzyzewski and and other deep learners uh, talk about other astounding results, where they'd say. I don't know anything about blah, blah, blah field, but I tried training a neural network on it and it does extremely well. 
And those things really caught my eye and painted a picture for me of a disruption, like a classic technology disruption in the kind of Clayton Christensen innovator's dilemma sense. Because when I walked into Amazon, they weren't doing deep learning at all. In fact, I got a lot of the exact same results from, uh, or, or reactions from people like, yeah, I don't know if deep learning is really a thing. There's all these tried and true machine learning techniques uh, that, uh, that we're, we're relying on. And I found, like, it, obviously it worked out, right? Deep learning won. It is like synonymous with machine learning right now, unless you, you talk to somebody who's actually been at it for a while, which very few people have given how much uh, growth there's been in the field lately. Um, but living through a true technology disruption is a really rare thing in somebody's career. And it's really, it's really special. And, uh, and I was happy to be, uh, to experience that at Amazon. And, uh, it was a really fun experience. Was it clear that now you have SageMaker, you have Vertex and a lot of consolidation has happened over the past decade. Was it clear when you all entered uh, that marketing with kind of a market with a suite of services. I think a couple years later um, that a lot of the mega caps and AWS would would do so well. Um, what was the state of play um, when you all actually started productionizing some of these services and and taking it to market? And what was that kind of feeling like from a strategic perspective? Like how was how how was AWS viewing the market having entered it a little bit later? Yeah, I mean, we made some really kind of classic mistakes in launching Amazon Machine Learning, which is what that first service was. And I think the the biggest one was it, it was it was a sense of hubris. It was a sense of uh, that we had something really powerful that the world uh, the world couldn't do by themselves without our help. And therefore, I mean, frankly, the pricing model was just absurd. We, uh, we thought that our stuff was so cool that we could get away with value-based pricing rather than utility-based pricing. So the difference being in value-based pricing, you charge somebody kind of in an amount commensurate with how much value they receive for it, as opposed to how much it costs to produce, which is utility-based pricing the way almost all AWS services uh, are priced. And the result there, so we're thinking, hey, people could use this to make mortgage decisions or, you know, insurance coverage decisions or decisions where every individual case could be worth hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars. So, of course, we're going to charge them multiple pennies for every one of these, even though it costs maybe a thousandth of a penny in actual compute to, uh, to operate the, the underlying service. And the result of this was that we priced high volume consumers out of the market, 100%. Anybody who wanted to use a lot of this didn't even look at it because the prices were absurd. And, you know, there's all these good reasons that, uh, that went into making a bad decision, like, well, we can always lower prices down the line, but we can't raise them. And we can offer special deals to, uh, to high volume customers, but none of that actually uh, came to play. And we, we ended up dooming the service uh, from the beginning just by, well, I mean, one sense is we, we, we had our, our egos were too big, right? We thought our stuff was too cool and that nobody else would be able to do it. And the result was the people who actually want to use a lot of this stuff, well, they, they did it themselves. Um, so that's, uh, there's an interesting, uh, interesting lesson there. Um, I, it, and also to be clear, there was absolutely not, no deep learning in that first service that we launched in 2015. It was a logistic regression. It was simple linear models. Um, <laughs> we had hopes and dreams of building random forests. If you, if any of your uh, uh, people in the audience remember what those are. Um, but uh, my attempts to bring neural networks into the fray were generally dismissed as absurd. And uh, so, and this is this is what I meant about the the disruption uh, at play, right? There were these career scientists, brilliant people, like leaders in the field, who had spent uh, decades doing research on what are now considered traditional ML uh, techniques before deep learning, and they, you know, any time you present somebody with a situation where their experience. Um, their hard-won experience becomes less relevant, they are inevitably going to find reasons why this new thing 
is not as interesting as you might think it is. And so this is one of the one of the things that I really thought was fascinating living through this disruption was that uh, the like very smart, well-intentioned, rational people uh, there they have biases based on the inertia of the old technology. And the other thing that I think is also really interesting about living through this disruption at the time was that they were also right. It was a technological disruption, not in the, the tech crunch sense of the word, where disruption just means something cool, but in the sense that uh, it was originally defined in, um, in terms of crossing the chasm, where the technology starts out worse than uh, than the existing thing, right? It's like digital cameras in the 1990s. These were, they, they looked cool, sort of, but the resolution was horrible. If you press the shutter button, it took maybe a second before the picture actually got taken uh, after you press the button. There was, and, and you had this thing on this giant media card that you had to find a computer to plug it into, and not everybody had computers back in the 90s. So, like, the, and deep learning really was pretty similar to this in 2014, 2015, because you needed GPUs to run these models, and, you know, people are still struggling to find the GPUs they want. And back then, they had, they, they were so scarce, and the software to get them running was incredibly difficult, and the hyperparameter tuning to to get a neural network to train was super obscure and nobody knew how to do it. Like in a, in a very real sense that I didn't appreciate because I saw the, the power and potential, I didn't appreciate how hard it was to actually make a neural network work to get deep learning to do anything useful because it was such a young technology uh, at the time. So honestly, one of the most impactful things that I did it, during my time at Amazon was to convince the AWS folks, the EC2 folks, to, uh, to, to play nice with NVIDIA and to start getting their GPU fleet into shape because it was old and decrepit. Um, um, one thing that in particular that struck me that you said is the technology always starts out kind of worse. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to tell a bit of my background here, so I, I'm still in college in, in, in 2012. So by the time I start my career in earnest uh, in machine learning, deep learning had uh, come to prominence, was, was popular, and, and that is kind of where I started my career. Now, I was teaching at the time as well. I was still teaching tree-based models. There's still some research out there that says tree-based models outperform deep learning on certain types of tabular data which is mm -hmm. great, you know, it's not like deep learning is the answer to everything. But at the same time, so in, in 2017, as, as many people might remember, is when that Transformer paper came out and kind of started this whole wave. And back then, you know, GPT-1, which came out in 2018, BERT came out in, the, in a similar year. At the time, in some ways, those types of models were performing worse than current state-of-the-art RNNs, LSTMs, but in other ways, they vastly beat state-of-the-art just right out of the gate. When GPT-1 and BERT uh, get released in, in around 2018, we see that some NLP tasks were, were vastly being outperformed by BERT-like models like ELMO pretty much right out of the gate, and that was really exciting. But at the same time, if you were thinking about text generation, like you know GPT-1 and, and, and kind of decoder-based models are, are wont to do, it was still not showing as much promise as RNNs and LSTMs were, at least at the time. Now, that obviously, that is not the case anymore, and it took a couple of years, but I, I see a similar parallel there. In, in that vein, do you think some of the biases that you're talking about, or that you were talking about, also transferred over to this kind of newer wave of deep learning in, in, in the, in the transformer-based models and diffusion-based models, or do you see new types of biases also coming up as well? That's a really good question. I, I think it, the last time I took a, a deep head scratch on this one, I concluded that transformers were not a disruption over previous neural network architectures, but more a continuous innovation in the sense that they are really just better in, in almost every regard, and they don't force you to take a step back um, in in terms of of quality, they 
I, like a key thing is one place where they're definitely limited is their their context window, uh, their order n squared in the size of the input and output. Um, and so they're intrinsically limited, right? GPT-4 can only handle a mere 32,000 tokens, which is like 100 pages of text or something, right? But it can't, whereas an LSTM could go on for an entire encyclopedia before it got bored. Not that it would actually be able to train uh, on that context, but it's physically capable of it. Um, but I do think transformers are fairly continuous in, in terms of an innovation. Um, I think when we're looking at this stuff, it's important to consider the the big picture, which is not just the technology, the algorithm itself, but where it runs, like the hardware, the software tools, the libraries, the skill sets of the people, the market in which it's being deployed. Because in like 2015, those were the places where neural networks were suffering, right? The If you could get it to work, it was better in, in most cases, but the challenges were the CUDA libraries were a real pain to, to install. And getting the thing to train properly involved twiddling these eight or 10 different hyperparameters, the learning rate and the weight decay and the, the schedule and the, the number of layers and the width and all this stuff, right? And very, very few people in the world knew how to do that. And that was why I really focused my personal effort at uh, for much of my time at Amazon in AutoML and because I saw that as the way to bring deep learning to the world was to automate the choice of these fiddly hyperparameters. And like I, one of the things that drew me to this was trying to answer the question, why in 2012 did neural networks suddenly start to work well when much of this technology was invented in the 90s, where I say like the algorithms were largely unchanged. And the, the standard answer is compute power and data, right? And lots of people have, have talked about that. But I think there's another less told story, which is the number of different hyperparameters, all the complexity of configuring these things, that I think led to them being uh, tossed away in the late 90s and, and early aughts in favor of things like SVMs and algorithms that are just intrinsically more robust because there's fewer things to mess up. And a lot of what happened in the early 2010s is people started to figure out configurations where a neural network would work. And so we're in this mode for a long time where the only way to reliably get a neural network to do something was to start with a neural network that worked like you take AlexNet and people knew how to train AlexNet. They knew the exact shape, they knew the learning rate, they knew all the hyperparameters, and you just feed it a different data set and that would work. And so I set down this path of building AutoML tools to try to figure out this stuff and make them more broadly applicable. And we ended up building this, these features out in SageMaker. We built this cool tool called Autopilot that generates a bunch of code for you that, uh, that try a bunch of different ways of training something and, uh, and automatically pick the best one. And that is, uh, I mean, it's, I, I feel like that's kind of run its course at this point. Um, and that we're starting to see uh, AutoML replaced with uh, with a new paradigm in uh, in a lot of ways. Well, I mean, let's 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 pick up on that. I mean, the the new paradigm. I'm curious, kind of how how you see it. Um, but as someone who, so I, I'm a practitioner in deep learning, but I also teach deep learning. I, I literally just gave an introduction to deep learning with PyTorch class a couple weeks ago. And even nice. then, as I'm walking through you know, feed forward, convolutional, and transformers, it kind of ran the gamut. Um, people would always ask me uh, those, those questions like, how wide should it be? How deep should it be? And then you kind of have to uh, come back at them and say, well, there's no one answer. You kind of have to figure out based on the complexity and all that. So can, can you tell me kind of in your own words, kind of how you see this new paradigm shift? And, 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 and more specifically, I'm curious how you see it being different for the end uh, the end user as defined by the practitioner, the ML engineer, the data scientist, the person who's actually building these models to serve a purpose, uh, how, how has it changed in, in their perspective in, in this new paradigm shift? Yeah, so I think the thing that's really changed is not that the AutoML problem has sol been solved or it's gone away. If you're starting from scratch on a brand new neural network, you still need to answer all of those questions. And if you get them wrong, 
your network probably won't work very well. Um, and I had this vision and, and you know, other people uh, have uh, as well of a system that just really automatically figures this stuff out for you. And you know, there's rumors that Google has something that's pretty good at doing this kind of thing internally. And certainly uh, other folks have, uh, have made cracks at it. Um, but for real world impact, if somebody like is just trying to get a model out the door that does something, the the new paradigm that I'm uh, I'm hinting at is fine tuning an existing model rather than starting from scratch, mm -hmm. because what we've seen nowadays is that you while data is still king and you still need to understand your own problem really really well, uh, and data are the best representation of this, then there your problem is not unique. Almost certainly. In fact, the vast majority of problems are similar to ones that many, many other people have seen. And knowledge about these base ideas like language or vision or audio, these base concepts can be encoded really well into a pre trained network that you can fine tune and adapt for your specific task. And we see the uh, multimodal large language models or the visual large language models or the large multimodal models, whatever you want to call them, that can handle both text and images and audio starting to, uh, starting to come out. Uh, and these, uh, my, my company Groundlight has uh, been investing uh, in this technology as well. These make it possible to start with, you still need your own data to make a, a system reliable in the real world, but you don't need to figure out a neural network architecture or really how to train it. You just need to be able to adapt something that already exists to your specific problem. And in the vast majority of cases, this is what a practitioner should do. You want to understand something visually, you start with a good vision model. You want to understand some text, you start with a good LLM. Um, and when, if you're starting with something, that means whoever built that thing spent a long time optimizing all those hyperparameters that you don't need to think about because they're just going to spit it out in the form of uh, 100 million parameters for you to, to use. Yeah. Um, and, I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that is, I mean, part of the course was also, hey, let's take this relatively simple problem and try to build a network from scratch. And then the second half of the lecture was, hey, what if we could find something on the open web under a public license that we could also borrow and use for our task? So, you know, pun intended, that, that kind of knowledge does transfer over, right? Because we are, we're Absolutely. talking about transfer theory, we're talking about transfer learning, and I think that is a a huge step in the, and again, as a teacher, it is a big step in the teachability and adoptability of this kind of technology because I come from a research theoretical math background, right? I wrote my master's on elliptic curve homomorphic encryption as, a, as it relates to voting machines. Mm. And that gave way to, hey, AI seems kind of cool these days, again, 2012, 2013. Let's see what's uh, what's going on over there. So I think that kind of knowledge, again, pun intended, does really transfer over and it leads to more people kind of uh, getting into that field. Now, obviously you mentioned Groundlight and we wanna hear a lot more about that. Can you start by telling us a little bit more about what Groundlight is, what problems you're trying to solve uh, and we can, we can go from there. Sure, um, so Groundlight is a computer vision service that's based on natural language. So we offer a novel way of putting together a visual understanding system that doesn't require building a giant data set in order to get started. And so one of the things that I observed from all of these uh, AutoML products, and there's great AutoML products out there today, no question about them, but many of them, frankly, they're, they're uh, their instructions are kind of like a short course in machine learning. They they help you, they automate a lot of the aspects of building machine learning, but you really need to understand it pretty well in order to, uh, uh, to be successful with it. And more importantly, you need to bring a data set. And they follow the traditional waterfall approach to uh, machine learning development, which is start with a data set, find it, gather it, buy it, whatever it is, label that data set, and then train a model on the data set. And once you have the model, evaluate it, see how good it is. And it's probably not as good as you need. So go back to the beginning, get more data, buy more data, label it, train again, evaluate, and repeat that over and over again until it's good enough. And then you're done with the model, you throw it over the wall and you start using it. 
And that's a, that's a cumbersome process that can take months, if not years, to, to get going. Uh, ground light short circuits all of that by combining all of those steps into one and combining best practices in terms of uh, MLOps and uh, uh, that you're going to want down the line and using humans in the loop from the very beginning. So with ground light, all you need to do is describe your visual task using natural language. And then we put together a customized computer vision model for you, starting with our visual large language model, but also including humans in the loop from the beginning. And a key aspect of it is that ground lights models always know when they should say that they are unsure. We ask binary questions, but there's always three answers, yes, no, and unsure. And anytime any of the models are unsure, they escalate to the next level. And we have multiple different sizes of models. We have very fast, very cheap models that will take a first crack at things. If they're unsure, they escalate to a bigger, like a, a VLLM style model. And if they're unsure, then they'll escalate to our human monitors who will evaluate the image and the question in real time and provide an answer so that your system can keep running and you still get effectively synchronous results. Sometimes it takes 10, 20, 30 seconds to get an authoritative response uh, from a human monitor. Uh, but you're still making an API call, which is just a single line of code that says, tell me if the door is open or tell me if these uh, two metal strips are aligned or tell me if the part is ready to go in the CNC and uh, your system can, can keep operating without needing to develop a data set before you can turn it on. The promise of getting started and having um, computer vision outside the box without uh, spending a ton on labeling or, like you said, investing in a ton of processes behind it is really promising. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, how you've been able to do that and, and deliver that value to your customers? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's taken, uh, you know, it's taken some work. So uh, I started on this personally in 2019. Um, we've, uh, you know, we put this team together in uh, in 2020, uh, and we are getting the system together. And we are uh, just now uh, opening it up to early access to external folks who uh, uh, have real problems that we can start to work with. And a key thing has been focusing on this calibration of the model so that they know when they are, uh, when we can trust the results and when we can't and how to convey this to the outside customer so that uh, they know how to set the appropriate confidence level that they need for, uh, for their system. Also, this, this technique doesn't work for everything, right? Sometimes the system responds slowly. You can't drive a car if sometimes it takes 20 seconds to decide if there's a stop sign in front of you, right? Um, though like autonomous vehicles have received a ton of attention for good reason, there's a trillion dollar economic prize there uh, for whoever figures out autonomous vehicles. And we're starting to, you know, get the reality of, uh, of how difficult that is. But also in a sense, that's about the most difficult computer vision problem you can imagine, because you've got maybe 50 milliseconds to look at a picture and make a life or death decision. And you can't be wrong, right? And even the, I'm not sure, the only safe thing to do is slam on the brakes and you know, people hate that. Uh, and that can be dangerous too, right? So we, there's a big class of problems that we, we don't work on. Our, our system works best for uh, situations that are sometimes latency tolerant. Um, uh, and high value problems and problems where the situation is changing uh, uh, fairly regularly. So a place that we're seeing uh, a lot of uptake is in manufacturing, in um, inspection, for example, and especially for what's called high mix manufacturing uh, in, the, uh, in the lingo, which is to say, uh, organizations, small, medium businesses, a lot of the time that don't build the same thing 24 seven for 12 months at a time to put out 10 million units. They get contracts to build maybe a thousand uh, units or maybe 10,000 units. And every few weeks or months, they're changing their process to start building something new. In this kind of situation, the idea of deploying any kind of automation, much less computer vision is often seen as completely intractable and impossible for, for these manufacturers. They have people who do fairly repetitive tasks uh, to operate things like lathes and CNC machines and, uh, and mills and what have you um, to make sure that they're, they're operating correctly. But in it, 
with ground light, they can set it up so that there's a camera watching and the camera kind of acts like an intern and it, uh, it you know, when it's still learning, it asks for help a lot of the time. And um, we have one customer where the the uh, factory operators on the ground are sitting there pressing a pressing an accept button on the robot whenever the system's unsure. And they are the experts. They know exactly what's going on. But over time, the system internalizes their their results and doesn't need to ask for uh, ask to be double checked uh, nearly as much. So we're it's yeah. it's pretty exciting to be able to bring this technology into uh, the kind of long tail of the manufacturing space, where you know we talk to folks in machine shops uh, all the time who say, "Oh yeah, no, uh, putting a putting a robot arm in, sure, like I know it would pay for itself in you know four to six months uh, and replace one of my operators, but there's no way it's going to work." And when we tell them, "Hey, we actually have people." Uh, 24-7 who are watching over the thing in case anything goes wrong. And that's what happens when the thing gets confused. Their eyes kind of light up and they're like, oh, okay, I get it. This could actually work for me. Yeah, so I, I am on record as someone who believes very, very strongly in this idea of the way you almost literally phrased it, trust in AI, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now you can map trust, the concept of trust to machine learning metrics like precision, you know, when you make a prediction, how confident is that prediction, calibration, fine. But at the end of the day, domain by domain, there are certain expectations of, of quality and trust, right? You, you mentioned automate, uh, self-driving cars, uh, and obviously the level of trust there is, is, <laughs> is off the charts, so to speak. But when you're talking about a uh, manufacturing factory level, it, it can vary. I imagine I, I, you know, I'm not a domain expert, um, but the, the idea that you can wait one second all the way up to 10, 20 or more seconds, depending on the task and the domain and the industry that you're in is something that I feel a lot of people not only have to know, but have to really engineer into a product that they're building, which you clearly have. And um, as someone who's also done Similar work in terms of, you know, less, uh, uh, more customer service based NLP, where the idea of escalation to a, a crowd of humans to kind of feedback loop on the AI, um, that, that makes a ton of sense to me. My, my question uh, to you is, in your experience with the ground light, what kinds of, how do you, I guess, how do you think about moving into a domain or do you not even think about uh, ground light as being domain or industry specific it's just more as customers come to you with their problems do you have to be more reactive to the kinds of quality and trust and speed and latency issues that they have or uh, do you find yourself having to be more reactive to customers coming to you saying i need to solve this visual task it, 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 this is our domain this is our our quality metric, or is your philosophy more, these are our guardrails, these are our latency uh, possibilities, and then do you, from there, search for domains and industries that kind of fit that bill? I, I, I'm asking more for our listeners who are building ML for customers. And a lot of the questions that I get, um, as again, I, I teach a lot of entrepreneurship and, and, and machine learning is, well, how do I find the right user for my machine learning problem that I'm trying to solve? And that's a tricky question. And it usually just boils down to what problem are you solving? But you're solving a lot of problems. You're, mm -hmm. you're really not solving one problem. You're solving many problems through a singular you know, ecosystem of technology. So what is your and Groundlight's philosophy on finding the right customers for this kind of system? Yeah, absolutely. So the the technology that we've put together uh, with escalation and visual large language model and uh, being able to uh, automatically build a model for you that's uh, tuned for your specific problem and cheap and fast enough to run uh, it at scale, this is very general, as you say. It can solve a whole lot of things. And we, we're like, we're super ambitious. We w we're looking forward to powering the next generation of robotics as they wander around people's houses and offices and do all sorts of things, right? We think we're really on a cusp of this. Um, this is how we got started as a company was uh, 
uh, looking at some of the amazing things that are going on in terms of the mechanical abilities of modern robots, which are way better than what was possible even five or ten years ago. They're nearly at human capabilities, but they're frankly stupid in terms of their understanding of the world. And as we dove into this, we realized that what is really holding a lot of these systems back is perception and understanding what's going on around them. And so that's the that's where we, we started. And also so looking at where robots are actually used in the real world today, they're mostly in factories. And so that's what's led us to, uh, to the place where we are, which is helping uh, manufacturing and uh, uh, similar systems like that. The technology also applies to a bunch of commercial systems and, and like retail analytics and things like that. But focusing our sales channel is, uh, is important and useful so that, uh, because really building a complete solution is what matters in terms of building a business. Like having, just having the ability to make predictions is great. And we encourage uh, partners and systems integrators to, to, build, uh, to build more complete uh, solutions on top of this and we're we're ready to talk to anybody uh, about their problem but uh, to address kind of another aspect of your question um, you know what we're what we're uh, doing is amazing when it works but what are the failure modes well it doesn't work for everything it's not it's not magic uh, and the failure modes are generally in terms of cost and latency right the system uh, we give you fairly uh, explicit control over how accurate do you need the system to be and how how much money are you willing to pay for human oversight and uh, uh, you know and when the AGI uh, versions of this come online that are that are just as good as people uh, you can use that uh, that as well um, but the failure modes are that hey yeah your system isn't making mistakes but it's having to escalate every question to a person in order to achieve the kinds of reliability that we need in our system uh, and that means that it's both running too slowly and too expensive. And so that becomes a self-selecting aspect of it. It's a combination of kind of the specific visual scene, how hard the visual problem is, and the constraints in terms of speed and quality um, and cost sensitivity uh, in the problem. So that's, that's how, uh, those are kind of the key constraints that we think about in terms of, uh, of um, picking the ideal customers. We have one maybe more question, then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. But um, I really like this framework you and Sonata have been talking about, which is that for, you know, essentially batch and lower latency uh, tasks that, uh, you know, have some tolerance for error and allow for human escalation. It seems like a class of uh, computer vision problems that are probably going to be the first to be solved. But it also sounds like you've invested heavily in, that, quote, generalizable framework and core piece of infrastructure. My guess is there are a lot of founders working on building that and thinking through how the escalation first. So maybe on the final question, if you had to go back and tell yourself um, learnings about building that core element of ground light, um, and there's going to be a ton of different founders that put this in manufacturing, use it to solve problems in climate, pharmaceutical, tons of different problems in computer vision, what advice would you give to founders for building that escalation framework that is going to be the core of so many future computer vision applications? Um, gosh, uh, I mean, if, if I were talking to a founder who, who wants to build a computer vision application that, uh, that has humans in the loop and is uh, instantly reliable, I would definitely tell them to call me and let's talk because we've got this figured out and, uh, you know, we can't talk to every customer. Um, there's, it, it is not easy to calibrate uh, machine learning models. Like neural networks are confidently wrong, notoriously so. Figuring out how to tame that is a challenge. And if you look at what's going on with the, the GPTs of the world, all of the stuff about safety and uh, reducing harm, I feel like these are all kind of wrapped up in the same idea of like the hallucinations. The system doesn't know when it's wrong. And we've, we've developed a lot of tricks in terms of how to estimate this effectively. A lot of it is going back into the literature, the classic uh, machine learning literature that so many people in the field have forgotten now because it's all neural networks. 
Um, but there's a lot of good stuff in the old Bayesian techniques, which are expensive and complicated and need a lot of math. But uh, if you know how to apply them to these, uh, these modern systems, um, uh, they're really effective. If, if I were to go back and talk to myself from several years ago, um, and uh, give myself uh, advice about where the world is going. The, the things that are changing are, I mean, I, I feel like we are at a major turning point in society, frankly. Like, I feel like the world keeps pushing back the goalposts of what an intelligent machine is. Like, Turing defined this in the 50s, like, can it have a conversation? Like, yeah, yeah, of course, if we could ever do that, we would clearly have thinking computers. Well, these things are pretty darn good at having conversations now. And so people are saying, well, we need to be AGI. We need to be able to solve any problem that a human can do. I'm like, well, now they can pass any high school test, nearly any college test, like bar exams. Like, these things are pretty darn good at passing any general human task that's clearly defined. I'm like, okay, so now I hear people saying, well, okay, but does it have emotions or, or does it have a soul? We keep pushing the, the, the boundaries back in terms of, uh, what, how, how we evaluate uh, the qualities of these systems, but we still, we don't know how to trust them and we don't know when to trust them. And this, this, is, this is a tricky thing. I think this is always going to be a tricky thing. And this is why our company always has humans at the helm, uh, monitoring, keeping an eye on things and adjusting uh, the system in, in real time to whatever is going on. I, I'm actually really glad you brought that up because I, I get that question a fair amount too, is are we at AGI? Has it happened yet? And I, I basically give them the exact same answer. And I go, depends who you ask. Uh, and I go off on this kind of diatribe of Turing test and, and talking about why does an AI have to pass the LSAT when I can't pass the LSAT? Do I have GI? I like to think I have general intelligence. Um, so it, it always comes back to that. And then I always end it with saying, you know, too long, TLDR, I wish I had a PhD in philosophy, right? Because that's the idea of intelligence, um, for me, I'm not an expert in that. And I think depending on who you ask, you, we're, 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 we already passed AGI, we're 100 years from AGI, and when is Skynet, which is the second most common question that I get. But right. I, I really love how you frame that, the, the idea of moving the goalpost and, and, and really understanding it's not necessarily a finish line as long as it is solving a task that is... Um, usable by humans day to day. Uh, and as long as those tasks keep getting more and more uh, easy to define, more and more easy to implement, and, and as long as more and more people are getting value and they're getting kind of that comfort and the trust in that AI. So I really love how you phrase that. Mm, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, and I gotta say like, for, for people, if you're a developer and you haven't tried Copilot or you haven't asked GPT-4 to write your bash script for you, go do that. It is so, so helpful. And it's not, it, I mean, you could call it creepy, I suppose, but I think that that is the vision of the future for so many industries. I don't see these systems replacing people nearly as much as just making people more effective. And this has always been the story. We've been terrified of automation destroying jobs for, you know, close to 100 years. And what always happens is the jobs get up-leveled, they, they get more interesting and... Uh, uh, and not to say that big, fast economic disruptions aren't painful, right? I mean, automation can disrupt millions of people and put them out of work in a way that is devastating for them personally. And this is going to have a big societal impact uh, in the short term, uh, I think for sure. Like, I really think we are at a moment not unlike the internet being turned on in terms of new capabilities that are that are coming online. Um, but it's I, I'm personally super excited about it because the the way that I see it helping my professional life is it's it's wonderful. It's just a joy to experience, and I think that that's going to happen for a lot of people as well. That sounds like a great place to wrap it up until our next episode where we all uh, grow beards, get uh, pipes, and philosophize about Skynet. Until then, uh, Leo, thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, join us. We'll uh, link to Groundlight AI in the show notes. And um, yeah, thanks for everyone for joining us this week. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure.